Okay, so the next topic I want to talk about is using the substitution rule to compute definite integrals. So now we're looking for that numerical value at the end. Not just an antiderivative, but we want that value of the definite integral. Now you could say, well, there's nothing to this. Now I know how to compute the antiderivative, so now I just evaluate at the endpoints. And although that is true, there is a bit of a time-saving device that I'm just going to outline here when you're using the substitution rule. And what this is, is suppose you're staring at this integral and you do a substitution because you notice that there's a g and a g prime that appear in the integrand. Once you make that substitution, you could continue with that substitution, find the antiderivative, put everything back in terms of the original variable, evaluate at the endpoints and take their difference, and that's fine. Or you could change the limits of integration as well so they match your new variable. Right? These limits of integration are the x values. You could change your limit of integration as well and match the u value. And then you never have to come back to the original variable x. This is what this substitution rule for the definite integral says. It says that this definite integral is equivalent to this definite integral where you've changed the variable and you've also changed the limits of integration. So just to, to point, a few of the, point out a few of the key points, when you make the substitution u equals g of x, the original integral, or the original interval, which is on the x-axis, has now become this new interval on the u-axis. And when you're writing this thing in practice and doing your calculations, make sure you do not write that this integral is equal to this one, and pay careful attention, keeping the old limits of integration. Don't do that. And the reason is, is because when someone reads this, and the way one is to read this, is to look at these limits of integration and say, those are values of the variable of integration. But in this case, they're not. Those are the original x values. Those limits of integration need to be values of the new variable u. So you have to change both the limits of integration and your variable of integration simultaneously. So make sure you do not write this step where you keep your old limit of integration but your new variable. Don't do that. Change both the limits and the variable simultaneously. So let's have a look at some examples. Let's evaluate the following definite integrals. Um, again, this is very similar to one we just looked at where we computed the indefinite integral. We're going to substitute u is equal to 3t, du is equal to 3dt. At this stage, we get that this is equal to the integral of cos of u and then 1 third du. And of course, we could, as I said, continue on and say, well, now let's compute the antiderivative, plug everything involving t back in, and then use the original limits of integration. That's fine. It just involves that extra step of having to plug everything back in terms of t. Whereas instead, we could eliminate that extra step by just changing the limits of integration at this point in time. So if I look at the limits of integration, they are 2, t is equal to 2 pi, and t is equal to pi. What are our new limits of integration? Well, in terms of our variable u, u is equal to 3 times t. So if t is 2 pi, then u is 6 pi. And if t is pi, then u is 3 pi. So those are our new limits of integration. So this is 3 pi to 6 pi. That's what that previous result was telling us. That's what, that's what this result is telling us here. It's telling us switch the limits of integration. Switch the limits of integration at the same time you switch the variable of integration. And now we can go ahead and compute the antiderivative. So the antiderivative of cosine of u is sine u, and then we're going from 3 pi to 6 pi. So this becomes then 1 third of sine of 6 pi minus sine of 3 pi, and both of these are 0. So we get a value of 0 for our integral. How about this next example? We'll take a few minutes and just try it on your own and see how you do. Okay, so let's have a look. What should I substitute for? Well, I want to substitute for something whose derivative is also in there. I see this lonely u on the bottom, and I know a u in the denominator could come about of it as a derivative from a logarithm. So maybe I'll substitute for the logarithm. Uh, 
ln of u. And so dw is equal to 1 over u du. And so this then simplifies down to w squared and the d over u just becomes a dw. So there's our integrand replaced in terms of u. Now we've got to work on the limits of integration. What are our limits? Well, our original limits were u is e and e squared. So what's w? w is ln of e squared, or 2. And the other one is w is ln of e, or 1. So our new limits of integration are 1 to 2. And look at that. So our original integral, which look, you know, maybe looked fairly, fairly complicated, and now is boiled down to this integral, which looks really straightforward. So it's 1 third w cubed from 1 to 2. So that's 8 thirds minus 1 third or 7 thirds. And so there is our result. So what's interesting about this example, and it's worth pointing out here, is that we had these two integrals. We had the original function from e to e squared, and the integral represented the area of the shaded region. And we found that after a substitution, we managed to convert it to an integral which had the same value, but the function was different and the integral was different. So the integral that we converted to was the integral of the x squared function from 1 to 2. And we found that those two integrals were equal to each other, the same value. In terms of the picture, it means that these two areas are the same. So through a substitution, we managed to show, to show that these two regions have the same area. And you can see down below that the area is actually written. It's 2.33, or 2, 2 and 1 third, or 7 thirds, as we, we managed to compute. The areas are the same. But notice, we knew these two areas were equal before we even knew the value. Let's look back here. We had that this integral was equal to that integral before we even worked out the value of either of those two integrals, we knew that these two integrals were equal. So we know those two regions had the same area. We didn't know what the area was yet. But the benefit was, one of those regions was easier to work out the area of, and that was that second one with the squaring function. And so we worked out the area of that region, got it to be 7 thirds, and therefore we had the area of the first region was also 7 thirds. So this is the idea between the, of the substitution rule, taking a complicated what could be a complicated integral, converting it to one that's simpler and easier to deal with, that's equivalent. And don't forget to check your answers again using Wolfram Alpha. So for that last example, here we threw it into Wolfram Alpha and it came back with an answer of 7 thirds, so we know we're good.